How do you do? How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Bob Grant, unfortunately, is not here. I know you would love to hear him. He's a sensationally popular character, and he does a fantastic job. But they found a guy called Jackie Mason. I'm the guy. And I am going to replace him today for four hours. You're going to hear all the same stories that you would have heard from him. I'm going to make sure that you don't miss anything by not having Bob Grant here. Bob Grant would have talked to you about all the hot news of the day, and that's what we're going to talk about, all the major issues and what's happening, and we'll be respectful of every opinion anybody has on any issue that you like to express, because we want to hear what you got to say, and we respect your opinion. I'm not going to be abrupt with anybody, or cancel anybody, or tell you you don't know what you're talking about, like some uh, hosts do of these type of shows, because I thank God you're listening, and I appreciate you listening, and I, was, I value your opinion, and I have the highest respect for anybody who wants to call to offer any opinion as long as it's on a respectful level. Uh, the, we appreciate it. There's no hateful calls here because we don't deal in hate. We deal with love. That's how I became a hit. By expressing love for all people, no matter your race, creed, or color. This is Jackie Mason, the guy who has the hot show on Broadway. I don't want to talk about it. It's called Politically Incorrect. It's the biggest hit. Uh, Sunset Boulevard is struggling to make a living, and, Mom, and I'm a sensation every day. They take 200 Gentiles jumping and dancing to do a show. Here I do one Jew. I do the same thing. I don't have to jump and dance. I don't have to sing. I found out anybody could do a show with talent. To do a show without talent, this is the trick. To find out how to do a show on Broadway, stay there for months and months and years and years or seven years without talent. Everybody is wondering, how does he do it? There's a secret here that nobody knows about, and I hate to hurt your feelings, but I'm not going to tell you. And not that I'm in it for the money. Money doesn't make you happy. Everybody knows money doesn't make you happy. That's why I'm in this show. If I could make a living and on a show like this, then I would be walking around with a homeless man right now. If I buy a hamburger, I'm wiped out of the whole salary that I make on this show. But I don't think money makes you happy. That's why I'm here. I found out money could never make anybody happy. I know a guy lives in a house without a sink, without hot water, without a ceiling. He's got nothing, but he's happy. You know why? Stupid. If you're stupid enough to make a living without money. I don't want to ask people to come to my show because the place is packed. Unfortunately, once in a while there's a seat available. But if you want to take that seat, it's very hard to get it. It's the number is 239-6200 at my show. 239-6200. We can't allow more than two people at a time. Unless there's four, then we'll see if we could make room. But not more than that. And I'd appreciate it. Don't come into crowds because I want my audience to be comfortable. I have to have room for people. So please don't rush. But if you happen to come, it's up to you. Ladies and gentlemen... And uh, we're going to discuss all of everything that's hot in the news today. As some of you might know, the new year is coming. As some of you might not know, because we have many people of many denominations in New York, and everybody has a different kind of a new year. The, the Indians are celebrating their new year about three months from now. The Chinese two months ago. The Jews almost celebrate. They're not sure exactly when. Uh, the Reformed Jews have two days of our new year, the, or, or a day and a half. Or an Orthodox Jew has three days. Uh, my brother-in-law has a whole year like that where he does nothing. Everybody has a different kind of celebration. And that's why what makes this country so great. Why it's why I call my show politically incorrect, because it's incorrect now to figure out what's going on any place in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to call here, please remember that uh, right now the number is 203 in Connecticut, 203-862-WABC. In New Jersey, 201-489-WABC. From New York, it's 212-563-WABC. And these are the numbers if you want to say hello, discuss the subject, express yourself, tell us what you think on any issue, take a chance, we can't see you personally, so we'll never know if you made a fool out of yourself. Take a chance, call up. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into the whatever is happening in the world today. Right now, you probably have been studying the O.J. Simpson situation. Who hasn't? You have to have passed away not to be involved in the O.J. Simpson situation. I like to, to talk to people about the O.J. Simpson story, and every reaction I get is always the same. Who cares? I'm bored. I'm sick and tired. I've heard it to death. I'm not even interested. Then you say, you know what happened? No kid. What? What? Everybody likes to pretend they're too important to be interested, they're too intellectual to be concerned, and only the idiots are involved. And meanwhile, the idiots seem to include every person in America. Because everybody who's telling you they don't want to hear about it is turning pages looking for the story. <laughs> and every show on television that mentions O.J. Simpson immediately goes up to triple the ratings. So no matter what else is going on in the middle of the best joke, bing, there's a news about O.J. Simpson. So it goes to show if you want to get your name in the paper and you want to become the hottest commodity in the country, you have to kill somebody. It's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a uh, BBC report 
that I am doing together with Raul Felder on the issue of uh, O.J. Simpson. We're reporting f for, AB for BBC in London, and the report is coming from New York on a weekly basis. We've already recorded some of the shows, and we uh, luckily I've been privy to the inside stories of exactly what's taking place behind the scenes. And uh, Raul Felder, the prominent divorce lawyer, who's the most joy-shaking lawyer in America, we hear that the... Uh, that kings and queens from all over the world, as soon as they have a fight with their wife, they call Raul Felder. If you didn't have a fight yet, but you expect to, you could also call him. If, if, if happy marriages uh, don't do him any good, so please see if you can get along with somebody and give him a call. He happens to be here right now. Raul Felder, how are you? Hello, Jackie. You, you know, our show is a big hit in London, in England. Uh, people are dying for information about O.J. We, we have the radio version of the movie <laughs> Dumb and Dumber. They love us. <laughs> they, they love us. Uh, as you know, in March we go for a full hour, and then we go to um, we go to California when the trial opens. Hopefully, it'll open, and we spend some time there. And we're going to be in the courtroom, and uh, and we're going to illuminate for the people in England, and it's worldwide. It's BBC worldwide. So if anybody has a shortwave radio and they, they want to get the news, just call us. Don't mm -hmm. waste your time on domestic radio. Mm -hmm. I'm not Except this show. I'm not surprised that in London they're crazy about the O.J. Simpson story. They're probably a little tired of hearing about their own king and queen. They didn't kill each other yet, but, uh, but the story Some over time. there... But the story over there between their royalty has got to be the uh, dirtiest story I ever heard in any country in the world. It, it sounds like they, uh, they put into the monarchy a, a kind of, a, of a, an obscene movie. Every time you read about the king and queen, you never hear of a proclamation they said about affairs of state. All you hear is about affairs in the room. She almost had an affair. She's starting a new one. He thinks she caught him. He caught her. They have tapes. They have stories. If every time you... At 4 o'clock in the morning when you're watching a dirty picture on, uh, on some cable station, you don't hear as much vulgarity as you do about the king and queen. I don't know what they need them there for. And I hear that in England it's a very popular movement now to wipe out the whole idea of the monarchy because they've besmirched the reputation of the monarchy so terribly by those vulgar antics. I don't, I don't know how they have even time to walk around. They sound like there's one story after another in bed. They never leave the mattress. I don't know how they make a living. It's wonderful, isn't it? But you know, there is a movement now to get rid of the monarchy, but the striking thing is that you take England, which is a poor country, as you know, and... Um, Still, the average Englishman, when you meet him on the street, poor as he is, he says, oh, to the Queen, God bless her. And they put up with this, and millions and millions of dollars are spent on the monarchy. Uh, you know, when you go to England, London particularly, you could drive for miles on the outskirts of London. It's property owned by the royalty. It's remarkable. I don't think Americans would put up with anything like that. They have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property. They own billions of dollars of, of, of the country. And they, they seem to be interested in nothing but how to fool around 4 o'clock in the morning. I think it's disgusting. I would, if you have a sister-in-law that behaved that way, would you even talk to her? If you had, if she were good-looking. <laughs> if you know anybody, I could see being interested in that if, if you're looking for, for that kind of activity. But the affairs of state should have some respectability connected to it. I can't imagine how, how people could uh, tolerate this and get away with it. But I, I was in London, and when I played in London, I played for a Royal Command performance, and I was shocked to see exactly what you're talking about. I did a Royal Command performance. The Queen of England was in the balcony, and I saw a kind of worship that I only saw uh, at a midnight mass in, 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 in St. Patrick's Cathedral or in, a, in a, or in a temple on Yom Kippur. The kind of awe that they had for the, for the Queen Mother when she was introduced to the crowd, and then the Queen herself was a kind of thing of worshipful. They all sang a song to her. They have some special English song of, of hero worship, like, like, like as if she was literally a god. And this is the same day that I read in the paper that the daughter is in bed 4 o'clock in the morning with these guys. This one is taping a, 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 not a dirty story. Uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, they have a different dirty story for every hour of the night. These people haven't slept in 30 years, but I won't go into that because I want to keep the show on a high level. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a message for you is that right? We have a message for you of great significance. Listen to this and we'll be right back. This is Jackie Mason for Bob Grant. I had an idea. You were talking about the in improbability of the English people being in a deprived state and still worshipping the Queen. One thing always puzzled me, and I never asked you this before, and your audience may here may not know, Jackie is a huge hit in England, maybe even a bigger hit than he is in the United States, and I've seen him give the Queen's performances and so forth. Now, you're the least likely person that I would ever think would be a hit in England. How, how do you explain that? That's I find that I find that a terrible I find that a terrible insult yeah. to say that I would be the least likely person to be a hit in England. That's the most humiliating thing. But do you want me to tell you the yeah. truth? I felt the same way before I went to England. Yeah. I almost didn't go, 
And I went there without luggage because I think I won't have a chance to stay there for more than 10 minutes. And everybody begged me to try it. And that the, the people who begged me to try it were all vicious enemies of mine who wanted to see me wiped out. Because I couldn't find one friend anywhere who thought that I would do good in England. Uh, now they tell me, oh, why not? Why shouldn't they like you? They like you every place. Everybody who tells you that is a fraud, a fake, and a phony. Because the simple fact is there was uh, one Jew or Gentile anywhere in America who thought that I would do well in England. Because, first of all, most American comedians bomb in England. Our very best, the most popular comedians have almost always stunk in England. Danny Kay was a sensation, and maybe one or two others, but by far the majority of American comedians when they go to England cave in. And by far the majority of the English comedians when they come here also cave in. I don't want to mention names because I don't like to talk about disasters in public, and I certainly don't want to besmirch the reputation of anybody, but the simple fact is that most of the people don't translate well in the opposite part of the ocean. Now, the question is, why did I do well? And that's a very good question because nobody will ever live to figure this out. I came out there, and as soon as I said hello, I, when I performed for the Queen of England, I did a Royal Command performance, and I said something that I, that I thought might not go over with them because it's an outrageous kind of perverted humor. I said, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I, I resent the whole idea of being here because, I, I, first of all, I'm in a country I never heard of. I said, England might be a great country to you. To me, it's not. <laughs> I said, I hear competitions every day about every country. England is never even mentioned because people don't think too much of this country. <laughs> this country is, the, all I know about this country is the Boston Tea Party. Since the tea, nothing came, nothing <laughs> happened. I don't even hear about a cookie from this country. <laughs> I said, who cares? All I know is that you cost us everything. Every time you hear about loans, it's to England. Money back, never. There was a lend lease program to England. My sister-in-law sends money to England. Three cousins. Every body time I talk to them, they need a sandwich, a piece of cake. They always needed something. They never could make a living here. All I know is they walk straight. They don't make a sound. There's no excitement here. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> the only people having a good time is the king and the queen. They're busy with each other, running around from house to house, four o'clock in the morning. The rest of the country is standing still and doing nothing. So why should I be excited about England? Now, you would think that this would be a, offensive a, a, to the offensive. queen. Yeah. Instead, they were laughing their heads off. I said, do me a personal favor. Never call me back here again. <laughs> I'd be the happiest man in the world if I'd ever see this country. Because if I do good here tonight, the only thing I could do is get another opportunity to come back and work for nothing again. <laughs> I said, there's a limit how many times I want to work for nothing for people who can't even talk English. <laughs> I said, you talk with such an accent. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know. I forgot what I do for a living every time I come here. And as I'm saying this, the people are breaking up. And you know what the ironic thing is? That the Queen of England loved me. Loved me. After the show, she started to talk like me. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen of England loved me. And oh, the English people are crazy about me. And when I tell it, uh, when I come back here and I do a show in Brooklyn, yeah. they say I'm too Jewish. <laughs> I'm always too Jewish for, for every yenta in Brooklyn. But I, I sound like the perfect Englishman, the, the Englishman, <laughs> who have an accent that I don't even understand. The, the people of the greatest culture in the world, Oxford University, yeah. gave me an award. In what? As, uh, two or three awards I got from Oxford University. The whole, both houses of parliament came to see me. <laughs> Oxford University had a dinner in my honor, a banquet in my honor. I never ate so good in my life. <laughs> Even when I didn't show up, there was another dinner. You know, I didn't have to buy a meal for a month and a half when I was there. I was getting banquets and dinners every day. I came there weighing 115 pounds. I came back 340. <laughs> Before you meet the queen, do they tell you what to do? Do you have to curtsy? Or? Yes, they do. You have a special ritual about yeah. the simple fact that you're not allowed. Yeah. You're not allowed to even look at the queen or refer to her in any way. So what they do you want do? no jokes about the queen and no references to her, no acknowledgement even of her of her existence. Yeah. You're supposed to pretend she's not there. Why they have this rule, I don't know. But after the show, you meet her? But after the show, uh, they tell you to curtsy when she approaches you. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you call that? A bow? Bow. bow. It's bow, a bow. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and as she approaches each performer, I have to be honest with you, she told exactly the same thing to each one. <laughs> I thought that I was a sensation because she looked at me and she said, Hey, you were so fine, you were so lovely, you were so wonderful. When are you coming back? When are you coming forth? How long have you been there? When are you coming, going? I said, Oh my God, she's fascinated with me. I hope she doesn't try to marry me because I'm busy. I thought she was falling in love with me. Turns out that she said exactly the same thing <laughs> to every performer, even the janitor in the building at the same speech. And if she crossed the street, she said the same thing to the cop on the beach. She said it to every she saw. 
And it turns out that it's not such a phenomenal compliment, but of course it's a beautiful courtesy to be able to, uh, to show appreciation to whoever the poor friend is that showed up. And after the first time, yeah. I got another letter to come the second time, the third time, and the fourth time. I've already done four Royal Command performances. Okay. And now tonight, when I go to Broadway to do my show, and after I tear the house down, and everybody will be standing and applauding, not that I'm showing off, but that happens every <laughs> night. And after yeah. I get the biggest laughs of my life, there'll always be a yenta someplace from Brooklyn or the Bronx. They'll say, well, she could have enjoyed me, but I'm a little too Jewish. But uh, Jackie, <laughs> the fact is all the comedy shows have closed on Broadway. You're the only show left, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's not left and right. It's a simple fact that the comedy shows have closed. Uh, sometimes there's nine comedy shows that are a sensation, and sometimes there's only musicals. Somehow, for, this, for some reason, I can't understand. All the musicals are now packing the buildings. Everybody is watching airplanes flying. The musical uh, in, on Broadway are now matters, uh, are subject matters that nobody understands. Nobody even follows the theme or the story of a musical anymore. Nobody knows what the music is even about. All they know is that it's busy. They, they, uh, Broadway now became a kind of a show exactly comparable to Las Vegas. You see girls dancing, people jumping off buildings, smoke is flying, my motorcycles are turning, things are crashing, and you ask anybody, what was the show about? I don't know. All I know is I never saw such a show. But the show is now about, about activities and events and, and crashing buildings and exciting activities. You see people flying off chairs and furniture. You don't see a show. Nobody knows what the show is about. There's no more stories on Broadway. There's flying furniture. Flying furniture has replaced Broadway shows. But you know, Jackie, uh, you have a one-man show. Now, it's my recollection other comics have tried one-man shows, right? There's been a number of them, and each one of them has flopped, no? Each one of them has flopped because, let's be honest about it. Some of them are good comics, yet they flopped. Well, I, I can't yeah. say all of them have flopped. Lily Tomlin, the lady, Lily Tomlin, who was a yeah. brilliant performer and did it twice, was a phenomenal was years ago. And that was about ten years ago yeah. or eight years ago. Victor Borger, uh, five or ten years before that. Victor Borger is his name? Yeah. Victor Borger, the genius with the piano, did brilliant shows on Broadway. Since then, about 9,000 people tried it and they all failed. Because, let's be honest about it, it's not an easy thing to do a two-hour show all by yourself. I don't want to show off. It's not my nature. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, try to tell people that I have more talent than everybody else. That would sound self-serving. And, and, uh, and it sounds a little arrogant to even say it. No matter how true it is, it's not nice to talk about it. That's why, uh, despite the fact that I seem to be better than these other comedians, uh, I'm embarrassed to say it. That's why I never bring it up in the conversation. Let's see if we can get a call from somebody who's calling here. There is Moses from... Uh, who had oh, we're going to take a break first, and then we're going to get back to Moses on the phone. Please hold on, Moses. Tell I'm going to get to you. I'm sorry I took up too much of your time to wait. Right and we're going to get right back to you after these kind words from a very important people who are trying to make a living from this show. Hello? Yeah. Sal? Hello, Jackie. Yes, sir. Sal oh. from Connecticut. How are you, sir? Cass. Yeah, how are you? Cass from Connecticut. Sal. 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 Cass. Make up your mind. <laughs> well, all right, Jackie. Who is this? Who am I least, talking least, to right now? At least you have me smiling. You know, for the longest time, I was focusing on an issue that, uh, that had come to my attention, especially when you took a look at uh, politics, Mr. Yes. Giuliani. Right. Back in the early 80s. Right. Now, I don't know what took place between then and now, but there was, um, you kind of faded out of the picture. And I was wondering how you feel about the approach that the mayor, in my opinion, was doing an excellent job on the question of education, about getting control of the budget and having the chancellor hand over the reins. I think Giuliani is 100% right in his contest with Cortinas. I know that a lot of people uh, think Cortinas is doing the best possible job and that they're very excited about these efforts to, to cut the budget. And he has cut the budget to, to quite a bit. Uh, close to 20% so far, but the truth really is that it's no place near the kind of emasculation that the budget really deserves. Anybody who's in education, who works in the school system, will tell you that it's overburdened with, with personnel that serve no purpose, that there's so much duplication in the whole administration of the system, that if anybody took a knife and really cut through all the waste that's taking place in the, in the right, Board of see, Education... Jackie, we, yeah. we gotta stop... Jackie, we sound like butchers from the Lower East Side. We gotta stop looking at it like a piece of steak. It's not a matter of cutting fat. I'm a New York City school teacher, and I've been right. teaching for seven God blessed years, and I, and I enjoy and I love. Now tell stuff. me the truth. You don't think there's a lot of waste in the administration of there's the system? There's plenty of waste. There's waste on radio. There's waste in Hollywood. Well, well I want to ask you a question. If it, if in private industry, when they see waste, don't you read in the papers every day how they cut out the waste, how they uh, how they fired a thousand <coughs> people from this company and that well, company? The last thing I'd don't you do know that they're downsizing? The last thing I'd want to do with public education is make it not Jeff Jefferson, I Jeffersonian over there, whatever you want to call it, but. 
If the state is asked to remove and you bring in a private firm to run a school, you're going down the wrong road. But don't you think there's something wrong if only 40 cents out of every dollar goes to the classroom? There's got to be something wrong. I'm absolutely sure you must be upset there's by this. Wrong. There's absolutely something yeah. wrong. So when, when you say don't take a meat cleaver and chop people, we know that we should not take a meat cleaver and chop people. We know we shouldn't endanger the children and, uh, and destroy the school. Do you know? Yes. Do you know where that cleaver goes in the Board of Education? Do you know who gets chopped? The people who print the checks for the teachers. We're not talking about what they're doing now. We're talking about what we should do. What we should do is downsize the system so that it's efficient, so that it works sensibly, so that people are getting paid now, for nothing. Now, now you sound like an IBM. -er. Now you sound like an well, IBM. -er. Well, we We're need talking a... about education. You Edu can't downsize school. We're not talking about downsizing schools. You're not even listening to my end of the conversation. I'm listening. I'm You're not with listening. You. you made me smile earlier, but what I'm asking you, Jackie, is to tell me, do you agree with the mayor? And I... then, when the city takes hold of these reins, what do we do? Could you listen carefully instead of just uh, do, talking to one end of a conversation? You're talking by yourself. You're talking for me and you. And whenever I talk, you don't listen and you don't care what I say. So how can I run a conversation with you? Jack, I'm you made sorry. up your, You made up your mind that you got the no, answer. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, you, I, I say, well, it's your fault. I'm you made me laugh. So now I just want to listen to myself talk. Go ahead. You say something. I'm trying to tell you something. That every major company in America, when they begin to see that there's waste in the company, downsizes. They, they make time and motion studies. They find, make efficiency studies. They find out who's saving a purpose and who's wasting money and they cut out all the people who are the riffraff and the frauds and the fakes and the maladministration that is taking place and we have we know very well that right now in in los angeles they teach a student for one half the price that we teach a student in this city in the in the parochial schools they teach a student for one third the price that they teach a student in the public schools we know that there's a huge amount of waste in the system and he's trying to cut out the system if and when he tries to attack people who are serving an important purpose like a teacher and a student then of course we should we should make an issue out of it and put a stop to it i would be against giuliani disturbing one classroom or one student but the question is, where is the money going? And why shouldn't we investigate it thoroughly and find out where it is and chop it out? Just like every major corporation is doing every day. You read that about Bell Telephone, General Motors. You read it about every major corporation in the country. And nobody says they have no right to cut. They cut if it serves a purpose. And they, if they could do it, we could do it. And we should first try it before we decide that it can't work. And find out where the cuts could be made, and if and when we're cutting the classroom, we should stop it. But if we find all the maladministration, the waste and the fraud, and the duplication that's been going on, building up people, collecting checks for nothing. All over Brooklyn, every place I go, I meet a person who just collected a check from the Board of Education. What do you do for a living? Well, I sit in a building in Philadelphia, I come in once a month and a half, and one, guy, uh, one custodian is working, one is not, one is collecting checks, one forgot where he works, one doesn't know where the building is, one is, uh, one is left uh, for Florida nine years ago, and is still collecting checks. Well, let's find all these people and throw them out. And after that, we'll preserve the classroom. Thank you very much. How do you do, sir? It's a pleasure to talk to you. I've heard Thank you. I've heard about your organization. Do you want to explain to the people what it represents? All right. It's the National Anxiety Center. Been around for about four years. And uh, at this time of the year, we uh, look at uh, all the most dubious news stories of the year. And your purpose is what? Well, mostly to encourage people to understand that all those headlines that say that uh, we're going to die from everything we eat and drink and breathe uh, just uh, ne are not necessarily so. When you say they're not necessarily true, are you denying the, uh, the, ver the veracity, the integrity of these people? They're lying to their teeth. Are, they <laughs> are you trying to claim that they're purposely lying just so they can sell papers? Uh, or, or, are you, or are you trying to say that they're misinformed? Uh, the newspaper uh, people, journalists, whether it's print or broadcast, are uh, extensively manipulated by organizations that want to frighten the public for one reason or another. And, now, what, what uh, have they got to gain by frightening the public, of, for instance, about pollution? When they claim the pollution in the city of New York is so high and the air is so full of filth, dirt, and garbage that every time you breathe, you're about to pass away. Uh, or that the lifespan of an average person, without exaggeration, I've actually read, is something like six or seven years less in New York for instance, than it is in Montana, because the the difference in the air quality. No, is it's, it's it's the difference in the stress and the anxiety in New York. <laughs> you, but how do you know? The minute you hit the sidewalk, you've got a problem. Now, how do you know that it's not true that the difference in the quality of the air, that the pollution itself, is choking people to death? How do well, you know? I'll how do you know that it's the, that the effect of it on your in your lungs, if cigarettes 
could shorten your lifespan. How do you know that the air in New York is not so polluted that it doesn't affect your lifespan? Well, I suspect that there's some pollution in the air in New York, but I also uh, suspect that you could park every car, truck, and van in New York and New Jersey and Connecticut, and it wouldn't have the slightest effect whatsoever. But you're saying you could taking a guess. You don't know if no, it's no, true no. or false. No, no, no. It's not a guess. When you see the weatherman on the TV at night, yeah. where is the wind coming from? Where's the, where's the all from the, the storms and the wind and the schmutz? Oh, wait, am I confused? <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. Where the wind is coming from is not the point. The <laughs> no, point no, is no, that it is the point because why? most of the pollution that we live with in the new Northeast yes. comes in from Midwestern states. Regardless of where it comes from, the fact is it's landing here in your nose and in your throat and it's affecting your breathing. So what difference does it make to me where it comes from? Well, this is uh, maybe, more, maybe, good, you, this more is good news. I got more good news for you. Right. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the EPA gets all worked up over uh, tailpipe emissions from cars. Right. Well, the fact is that uh, carbon monoxide uh, has been reduced 90% in the past uh, decade. Modern cars, cars made in the last five, six years, uh, produce as little pollution as is uh, technically possible. They're, they're engineering miracle. Yeah, but you, you, you left out another important fact that the huge amount of industrialization that is taking place and the tremendous amount of development in every other activity that creates so much of pollution from all the other forms that are taking place in this whole state is about 10 times higher than it was 20 years ago. Well, I think in any big major urban center like New York... But the point, is, the point is that the impact of all this pollution on your lungs is, is something that's immeasurable. And now you, you are making a statement <laughs> that it can't necessarily hurt you because you feel like making it. Yeah. You have no documentation to prove your point. Uh, you I have a documentation. Have documentation if I can get a word in edgewise. Go ahead. Let uh, me hear it. I'll give, uh, let's, let's concentrate on something we all know about in New York. Right. Do you remember a year or so ago uh, the schools were closed down from the asbestos? Right. And people were panicking in the streets and they right. didn't want to send their children to the schools? Right. It, Absolute nonsense. There's, there was no harm or threat to the children of New York then or now. There was probably more asbestos fl floating around in the air outside the school than inside the school. You have about a 300% better chance of being, uh, uh, being hit by uh, uh, lightning than... than now, when, asbestos. You make, when you make this statement, what's your documentation? What's your, how do you uh, know that you're right? Files and files and bookcases and bookcases full of it. I've been a business and science writer for about 30 years. Okay. So if asbestos is, is a comparatively non-threat to the country or to the people, and if it was an exaggerated, fraudulent threat, what was the reason for the threat? Who created it and why? Well, there are a lot of folks out there who uh, are, uh, we we'll lump them all together and call them environmentalists. And uh, they're very busy trying to scare the daylights out of everybody and convince us that we're all dropping dead from pollution and asbestos and radon and chlorine and... Uh, uh, well, I want to ask you... I wanna... and, and the reality is quite different. What is the difference? What is the reality? Well, the reality is, for example, the fifth major killer in the United States of America is accidents. It's slipping in the bathtub and breaking your head open. That, what is, just because one is the major accident doesn't mean this is less of an accident or the less of a threat? Well, an accident is an accident. If you die from it, it's pretty much the same result. Are you, are you going to try to say that murder is good for you because more people die by accident than by murder and that therefore we shouldn't get too excited about people getting killed because, well, because more people die? If I told you ten times as many people die from cancer as from being shot, does that mean you shouldn't get mad when people get shot? <laughs> what, are, what are you trying to say? That because there are threats that are greater, that means this is not bad? Well, I'll grant you there's no good way to die. But uh, in the United States of America, you uh, number uh, homicide is number nine on the list of things to die from, and suicide is number eight. Uh -huh. So more people are killing themselves than being killed. But what you're claiming is that the pollution is not a major threat in the city of New York? It's, it's not a significant health threat as we have been led to believe for years. Uh -huh. Now, uh, what is the other threat that people keep uh, threatening people with that you say is not so terrible? Well, let's uh, talk about, you were just talking about murder. Right. Uh, if you open up the newspaper, you'd be convinced that there's a giant crime wave in America. And uh, the good news is that the uh, crime statistics and rates of crime in America have not changed since the 1970s. There is no more crime in America today uh -huh. than there was 25 years ago. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm, giving, I'm being given signals by the bosses here that I have to change the subject and I have to get off the air. <laughs> So, so I wanted to make sure we get the main thrust of your message, and we got it. Don't take it personally that I have to leave you. God bless you, and I thank you very much, and we'll have to go off the air with this man right now, and now we will go to who? George. 
to go. We have a break now. I'm sorry. We have to get the commercials out because there are people who are trying to make a living here, and then we'll come back with the replacement for Bob Grant. Yours truly, Jackie Mason. How do you do? Thank you. So sure. I want to talk to Mr. Benyami. Mr. Benyami, about the guest before. Oh, I'm sorry. I only have 30 seconds to talk to Benyami, so I'll have to save him for after the commercial because the commercial is more important than anybody I know of. If my own mother or sister-in-law even called up right now and they told me, but there's a commercial, I would have to tell them, excuse me, first I have to make a living. I love my mother, but what good is it if I won't be able to support her if I cut out the commercials? That's why we're going to get to the commercials first. Then we'll get to whoever it is, like Mr. Benyami, to find out what's on his mind about the guests and the pollution problems in New York. The man said a lot of ridiculous things, and I want to get to him. So does my old fellow want to get to him. We all want to tell him what we think of him in just this a moment. This is the most listened to talk radio station in New York, Long Island, and the USA. WABC New York. It's 4 o'clock. From ABC News, I'm Doug Limerick. It is a grim, horrible day. It is another, yet another grim, horrible day. An abortion clinic worker reacting to today's murders in Brookline, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. A gunman dressed in black, armed with a rifle or a shotgun, killed two women at two abortion clinics. At least five others wounded. They were not patients. And the gunman is still on the loose. Reporter Alan Kahn says police have put out a des description. White male, around 30 years old, long black curly hair, wearing a long black jacket, dark brown pants. Uh, definitely armed, uh, possibly with some kind of shotgun. Yes, yes, this is Jackie Mason. How do you do? The man with the funniest show in the whole history of Broadway. Let's not talk about it because that's not the issue for this show, and I don't, I'm sick and tired of hearing about what a great show I have, even though I'm the only one that keeps talking about it. But the truth of the matter is, all the musicals all around me are closing. There's no more comedies on Broadway at all. I'm the only comedy show on Broadway. So if you're a Jew or an Italian walking around and you're trying to get a laugh, or if, you, or if you're black or Puerto Rican or Filipino or anybody else, of course, all you have to do is understand English. You, all you do is walk into my building and you can't stop laughing. And I'm ashamed to admit that I charge such a low price for my show. I'm giving it away for practically nothing compared to what it's worth. If people had any decency, they would send in a few dollars, but I don't want to bring it up. Ladies and gentlemen, let me get back to John on the issue of welfare. John? Uh, yes, Jackie. Uh, we were talking about the, the relative amounts of money that we spend on, on welfare, uh, and that, that people say, well, it's a very small amount of our budget, and we make the point that it's not just what you spend on it, but it's the other things associated with it. The fact that, you know, there's not a lot coming in from that. There's not like much you say, Like you said, from welfare, you don't pay taxes, but that's not even the, the main point. The main point is not how much compared to a national budget. What if somebody takes your money for nothing? Don't you resent it, even though it's not all of your money or 50% of your money? Let's assume somebody stole $40 off me. Does he have a right to keep it, even if he, just because he stole it? Does, do I, does he have a moral right to say, I'm obligated to give it to him for nothing? Well, what, what difference does it make? What percentage? The question is if you deserve it or not. If you're, God forbid, a helpless person who's immobilized in some way and you can't function or move and you need help, and any decent person would say positively help. Almost every poll in America shows that people want to help the people who are definitely helpless, who are so pathetic souls who can't help themselves. But the fact is that most of the people on welfare in every study proves that it's able-bodied people who are collecting checks for nothing. Now, this shouldn't be a racial issue or a question of liberal or conservative is a simple common sense issue. If your own brother-in-law doesn't feel like working, do you feel that you should support him all of your life? You tell him, go to work. You don't find out first, is he black or white? Is he conservative or Republican? Is he, does he want to work or not? That's all you ask. People cloud these issues in all kinds of fraudulent excuses and they rationalize problems that have nothing to do with the issue because people want to feel like they're liberals, they're crusaders, and they like to blame you if you're a conservative and they attack Newt Gingrich like he's a mass murderer. All he's saying is that the person should work for a living if he can. If he can't, we should help him. Well, Jackie, if, I, I agree with everything you've said. And right. I look at it like this. When I spend my, when they take my tax money, they take it away from me, right? And they spend it for things. If it achieves a good purpose, if it achieves what it's supposed to achieve, right. I really can't complain too much. Of course but not. But I don't see it achieving but, but what it's supposed you have to achieve. To, that's right. You have to be a phony fraud from top to bottom to claim that everybody deserves to collect checks for nothing, no matter how able-bodied they are, and uh, because they didn't have enough training. How does everybody else get enough training? How does everybody manage to find some way to make a living? And who cares which job you take? You're entitled to, to take a job, whatever it is, at the best you could do, at whatever level you could manage. Nobody 
always obligated to give you money for nothing. And somehow we, we that's another cliche. It's like the marijuana cliche. That the marijuana is, is, is harmful and nobody stops to care if it's good or bad. All they know is it's a dirty word. With welfare, it's just the opposite. Welfare uh, symbolizes liberalism and compassion and nobody stops to question, does it make any sense or not? Or is there a purpose in it or not? This is the first time in the last couple of years after, th- after 40, 50 years of giving out welfare to able-bodied people that people even have the knife to bring it up as a public issue. To even mention the idea of welfare. To even say that maybe an able-bodied person should go to work as though it's offensive to even suggest it. You wouldn't do it. You, would, you wouldn't give your own son any money after he's 18 or 19. You want him to get at least a part-time job even while he's in college. You, when, he, when he graduates college, you wouldn't give him a nickel unless he goes to work, or at least you have to see that it's impossible that he'd be starving in the streets. Talk to any 20-year-old kid and ask him, do you get any money from your father when you're not working? They all say positively not. I wouldn't even ask. I wouldn't even ask because I should be on my own. I'm at the age where I have no excuse to expect anybody else to support me. And now, this is between a father and son. A father wouldn't give a quarter to his own son if he's able-bodied that he's able to go to work. So why should you suggest that somehow people should have a right to walk the streets and you have to send them cash? You have to pass away from taxes while able-bodied people are... And you know what's even lower and worse than this? What's even more disgusting is when you suggest, after all the fraud that's obvious in the whole welfare system, where people assume that anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of the welfare people uh, are not only able-bodied but are collecting extra checks and triple checks and quadruple checks and are riding around with limousines in fancy apartments while the middle class of America is struggling to make a living, that you should have a system to check it out. They fight every system to check it out as though it's anti-democratic to suggest they should be fingerprinted. Well, as a comedian, I was fingerprinted on 20 different jobs. Uh, when when uh, when you want to work for the post office, you're fingerprinted. A cop is fingerprinted. Everybody else has a right to be fingerprinted and nobody says you're humiliated. Why don't I say when I'm at the airport and they try to search me to see if I'm carrying a bomb, I'm humiliated? Should I therefore say you shouldn't be able to search me because my humiliation is more important than bombs? Well, I... People should be exploding all over the world because I'm humiliated? Should the whole world go broke because a person is humiliated for being fingerprinted while he's collecting money for nothing? There is a sickness going on in this country that's about time we put a stop to it. Well, Jackie, I think that er- I agree with everything that you said, and my mouth is hanging open from listening to you. You are insightful, and, and you uh, put your finger on it, and you put it into words so much more eloquently than, than, than the rest of us can, and we thank you for doing that. Uh, like I said before, we, if, we, if we spend money, we gladly spend money, if it achieves what it's supposed to achieve, if it that's helps right. people, if it does what it's supposed to do, that's we'll, right. we'll gladly spend and even more. And so that's why when they say... Oh, well, you're a decent person to say that. I like the way you put it. If you put it with hate that you don't want to help anybody, I would have to argue with you. And but you're a man who wants to help a person who deserves it. Nobody has a right to ask you for help who doesn't deserve it. And I have no right to knock on the door of your house and say, give me half of your check because I don't feel like working. And you don't take, it doesn't take a genius to see how stupid it is that we're not allowed to question it, to investigate it, or make sure that nobody bamboozled the system and defrauds us into collecting checks for nothing. God bless you. I appreciate talking to you. I don't take it personally. I have to go to the next call. Here we have to go to um, uh, to um, Mike on the issue of marijuana. Mike? Jackie? Yes, sir. Oh, well, I'm surprised. All right, listen, first of all, I'm very surprised at your position on marijuana, unless I miss some of it. I miss some of your show. I must say this. I must say that I'm, in, I'm all for prescription marijuana for people who have a positive get positive results from it in terms of sickness and in terms of like Bill Buckley's sister who he advocates have, a, have marijuana prescriptions. I'm all for that. However, I've been a cop. I've been a New York City detective 22 years <clears throat> and I have a lot of experience in this. And I'm telling you, it breeds major problems, marijuana. Yeah, what way does it breed major It breeds major problems. And people are stoned. They drive stoned. Of marijuana. So, so why do you why don't you suggest that we should that we should uh, eliminate the, the whole idea of liquor? Why should that be allowed any more than marijuana? Well, Are you going to tell me that it's less dangerous? Actually, li- no, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not saying it's less dangerous. It's equally as dangerous. So how come you never suggested? How come you, you never? How come you not suggesting that we should that we should uh, uh, what do you call that? Illegalize? Uh, well, the way what do you call that? What's the, the way I'm looking wait for? Wait a while. Wait a while. What? The, the can't, why don't we prohibit liquor from being sold? Well, because. Liquor is prohibited to drink when you're stoned, when you can drive in a car. So why can't you say crack- this? Wait a while. Let me, can I finish? Yes, We're sir. cracking down mm. on intox driving all over the country. Right. Intox driving arrests have skyrocketed. Right. Because uh, uh, apparently everybody recognizes that there's major problems when you're stoned and you drive. Now, these people that, people that smoke marijuana for pleasure, they should do it in their house. That's great. 
Uh, well, uh, so you're saying exactly the same thing we said. We didn't say we should allow people to smoke marijuana when they're driving. We say you should be treated no different than liquor or cigarettes. We're saying that we, we, nobody condemns or prohibits you from smoking a cigarette. We should be condemned and, and stopped because people, it is a poison. We don't allow you to, 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 to inhibit, to inhabit, uh, uh, what do you call it, inhale. <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? We don't allow you to, to, to ingest any other kind of poison. But if somebody, if something else is poison, it's on the bottle or on the box. Uh, if this is poison, and you're not allowed to have it. Man. And if somebody serves you poison without being, you immediately would go to jail. Yes. You know that cigarettes positively cause cancer. There's no excuse in the world why a cigarette should be allowed to be sold, and marijuana, which has not been proven to cause cancer, certainly not to the degree that a cigarette does, is not allowed. Now, if, if you're talking May about... May I respond? Yes, please. I'd mean, I, I like to respond. And yes, before, please. Before I respond, I want to give the guy that's sitting next to you a yes. big hello, Mo Resna, good friend of mine. Couldn't hit a curveball. Right. That's his problem. Go ahead. Okay. What I say, this is Mike DeRosa, Mo. Mike. Yeah. Mike. How are you, buddy? Yeah. Well, right, go ahead. Let's say it about the issue because we, these oh, reasons yeah, okay, will Okay, go. okay, okay, Jack. Well, what, what I do say, yeah. what I do say in terms of marijuana, yeah. marijuana makes you eat too much. It gets you weak in your legs. Yeah. Everybody's floating. Right. I mean, it's really not the greatest thing. And furthermore, it's illegal now. Now, I say get prescriptions for people that w it will help and take care of them medically. They've, they've made prescriptions for, co for well, God bless derivatives it. and prescriptions for heroin. Right. They can make prescriptions for marijuana to help the people that are Well, but that's, that's exactly <laughs> the main issue we were discussing, the fact that they don't allow a doctor to, to, subscri to uh, prescribe marijuana at any time, uh, even if they, if they know positively that it serves an immediate, important, beneficial uh, 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 medical purpose. When they know that he can even save somebody's life with marijuana, it's not allowed. Even when in glaucoma situations, it's not allowed. We have absolute cases, one after the other, that are the year with us where they proved that doctors were absolutely stopped from it from using it at any time no matter how beneficial the purpose might serve but i agree with you that it shouldn't be allowed indiscriminately but if it shouldn't be allowed indiscriminately neither should liquor or cigarettes if they are allowed then this should be allowed there should be no difference uh, in the treatment of a person a person should not be in jail for smoking marijuana while his partner is drinking liquor someplace and he's on the floor uh, under a toilet passing away from liquor it's absolutely idiotic nonsense that one should be condemned and, and imprisoned while the other one gets away with it anyway thank you very much for your information hey frank you got a baseball question oh mike i'm sorry hello I'll see you in April. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello. Next, let's go to Dr. Oh, a break. I'm sorry. We'll go to the break and we'll go out. We've been talking too much about marijuana <coughs> and because the, the truth of the matter is we're trying to open up everybody's mind to realize the preposterous stupidity of people putting in jail for one drug which is comparatively harmless compared to liquor and cigarettes which is killing more people every day all over the world. And they, they have no beneficial effects of any kind whereas marijuana does. And doctors should be free to do what they please when they feel they have to help somebody and we should forget about this stupid blind prejudice against marijuana. But I don't want to go into that anymore. We want to discuss the effect of the situation right now in the baseball baseball situation uh, Morris has a situation there was a man there by the name of Morris Resner who wants to give us the latest update on the baseball <coughs> problem we're going to get back to the marijuana situation to the asbestos situation to the lung problems and everything else going on in this country but first we want to hear this from Morris well just in summary there was a baseball strike August 12th I say that the players have absolutely no right walking out in the middle of a season when they could have disputed it at the end of the season. They double-crossed the fans, they double-crossed the owners, and in effect they struck against themselves because they're really in business for themselves. This is as much a labor union as my having a chance to go to the moon. It is not a labor union. They've outgrown it. They're in business for themselves. It's management against management, and there's a limit to everything. That's the summary. That's the summary. The sir. owners created it. And the players are words, finishing it. In plain it. English, you're in favor of the owners right now. That's correct. Why is Senator Monaghan against the owners? He is taking the, 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 uh, the side of the players because, in his mind, he feels that this is a union situation. It is not a union situation. By law, it's but a union situation. But let's assume it is a union situation. Even if it were a union situation, how could you be on their side? How could a person who's making $5 million for playing with a ball for a month <clears> and a half, why should he be claiming that you're not allowed to make a cap on his salary. If you own a company, you're allowed to make a cap on any salary. That's what they call free enterprise. In every industry. If, I, if any industry in the world. Where do I have a right to claim that the $5 million is a pathetic predicament for me to be in and that I have to make sure that you have a right, that you have no right to stop me from making more than $5 million or $12 million just because you have the, the, the indecency to own a company? In, any, in General Motors owns a company. 
They make a contract with workers, and the workers has a cap on it. The All worker right. has a cap on the salary at the end of a certain amount of money. That he can't make more than a certain amount of money every year. Right. And they put caps through a union negotiation. <coughs> they reach a point where they decide that no more than a certain amount of money are they willing to pay. They don't call it a cap, but in effect, that's a cap. It's Any a cap. Anytime I tell you you can't make more money than this, and I make a limit to your salary, I'm creating a cap. Now. Now, now they never called it cap, so nobody complained. Right. If they left out the white cap, call it a yarmulke. Call it something else. <laughs> call it a snowsuit. And all of a sudden, they forget to complain about it. Besides which, how do they expect people to sympathize with a person making $5 million a year claiming to you about the trouble he's in and the misery of causing him by making it impossible for him to get more than $5 million? Do you think anybody in this country... Could you picture a middle-class person who goes to work every day and works a lot harder than any baseball player and suffers like a pig in a coal mine or in a post office? Could you picture if the boss said to him, the most you can make this year is $5 million. What All would right. he do? Would he say, I'd start the revolution, I'll never go to work again? Because what? They told me five million is my limit. I'll go but a step further than that. The, the, the management situation with players is different than any labor union because there is a salary cap in industry, but the, but the salary cap that's proposed now is not even a dollar cap. It's based on revenue. As the revenue goes up, it's 50-50 between the owners and the players. First of all, first of all, if I'm a worker, what right do I have to say that I do own a, a percentage of your revenue? Because they're not workers. What, what's the difference whether I'm a worker or okay. not? You have a right because you made the investment to make most of the revenue. I don't have a certain right to a certain percentage of your revenue. I have a right to say that I want a certain salary. That's the most I have a right to say. I want to ask you a question. General Motors made two billion or four billion, twelve billion last year. Did you see any worker say, wait a second, I deserve a certain percentage of that income. I'm only making eight hundred dollars a week and you're making ninety billion. I deserve at least 50% of your money. Could you picture them striking for 50% of General Motors' money just because they work for them? The deal is on the table. Nobody. They said they deserve more money because they want to be able to live better. They don't say they deserve more money because they deserve 50% of General Motors' income. Nobody ever said that. The deal is the management is sharing revenue 50-50 with the players. The salary cap is not really a salary cap in dollars. The dollars can go up under the cap. It's the percentage that remains the same. So if the owners make money, the revenue is higher. And if it's higher, everybody's happy. But they don't see that. I have a question. Why is it that the owners were the first ones to raise the, the salary yeah. sky high? Oh. That the owners made every player's salary into the millions before the players asked for that. That's correct. They outbid themselves. That's correct. It's the owner's fault to begin with. I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is a very interesting conversation. But we have one last check of traffic with John Del Giorno. John Del Giorno, don't take it personally, it's an Italian name. If it was Goldberg, I could have pronounced it nice. <laughs> uh, uh, let's get to uh, Keith. It says commendation. Keith? Hello? Is Keith available? Uh, I have him listed here. Dr. Bill, hello, Dr. Bill? How are you doing? Yes, sir. Go to a couple, couple of medical comments. I'm a pulmonary specialist. I want to make a few comments about, about uh, both marijuana and about uh, asbestos. Firstly, the study that the guy called before and he quoted from Columbia about uh, the detrimental effects of marijuana came out about 27 years ago, has been refuted over and over again, and is just a completely meaningless study. I'm so glad you told us that. I, that's, I, what, that's what I said before, that we're getting calls from people who throw out medical information, but they have no qualifications. Right, exactly. Plus, a lot of it is a smokescreen. I'll give you an example. He said that it's detectable at autopsy that you smoke marijuana. Number one, that's nonsense. Number two, even if it was true... Just because something is detectable at autopsy doesn't mean it was harmful. Right. And you can take a hair sample and see what... That's right. That's the, you see, that's the difference between talking to an intelligent person and these other calls. Thank You're you. making sense. You must be Jewish. Are you Jewish? Yes. See that? I, I can tell. Shabbat shalom. I actually. can tell. I can tell, I can tell <laughs> right away. A couple, a couple of let's see. Points. Let's see if we, if we could find one Italian who knows so much. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you know? A couple more points. First, yes. uh, another thing. The, there's not been a single... Just to give a, a valid medical point. Right. There's not been a single medical study, you said this over and over again, let me confirm that, not a single medical study that shows any, harm, any effects of marijuana nearly as harmful as booze nor cigarettes. Right. Not in terms of addiction, not in terms of, of cancer. No, I mean, it's not, you're not it's, even compare, you're comparing it's apples. An idiot, it's an idiotic comparison. Of course, it's stupid. Right. That's another thing. You know, you give an example before about if you drink too much water, you can float. Nobody's going to take that seriously, but I'll give you a simple example. If you abuse aspirin. Right. Your risk to your life and to your health is far greater than abusing marijuana. These are brilliant. Abuse. These are brilliant answers. I mean, it's a simple. It's a simple thought that it's nobody that they're all giving a lot course, of. Of course, of course. One more quick thing about asbestos. I wanted to compliment Raul Felder about what he said before 
in terms of the importance of the difference of asbestos risk with children. Right. As though, you know, the guy called you up and said, uh, in 75 years, there's never been a case of asbestosis. I'll tell you why that's nonsense, and I'm a, I'm a pulmonary specialist. Right. A certain small percentage of people that get lung cancer are not smokers. It's right. not a big percentage, but it, it's there. Right. How do we know how many of those might have it because of exposure as a child to asbestos? We don't know. We know asbestos causes cancer. Right. How do we know that the people who are non-smokers getting cancer... Are, are you saying the asbestos scare was justified or not? Well, there was a little bit of hysteria, but it was important that it did be taken out. You know, in other words, I think the hysteria was there. That's true. But you made a valid point, too. There was also hysteria about a lot of other things that turned out to be true. Right. So if you take it on a simple, rational basis, I don't think it's as important in office buildings with adults where their lungs are fully formed already. I see, but for children, children but it's, it's, it's a greater threat to a child's lung than it is to an adult's right, lung. Right, because how do you call a statistic out? There's never been a case of... of, of but, 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 but let me ask you a question. Are yeah. the, are the, uh, is the evidence conclusive that it was harmful or is harmful, or is it inconclusive yet? No, the evidence is conclusive that asbestosis or cancer can be caused by massive... Um, but, massive but, to the extent, to but to the extent that it existed in the schools, in your honest opinion... We don't but, know. That's the problem. I we see. Don't know so that so in other words, you're not saying that it defi definitely no, no, we don't know. Right. is a threat, but it could be, and because it's inconclusive, we should be on the side of the possibilities of the threat. Exactly, to be protective because, of children right. because of the possibility. Right, because if a child is going to run into the street, you care more about the chance that he might get hit. You don't say it's in favor of the chance that he won't. Exa that's exactly <laughs> well, You know, it's like when people say, there's right. not been a single case of AIDS being transferred... By, uh, kissing. I mean, it takes an idiot to say we should be in favor of the side that says it won't happen when you don't know if it will or not. Right, when it's talking about kids. Right. That's if I take a gun to your head and I don't know if it's if this bullet is going to kill you, you don't shoot to say, well, but since it's not definite, I'd rather take a chance. I'll tell you why it's even more important. Because if you're an adult, you can you can choose not to take a job as a call. Right. Or you can choose not to take a job right. in, a, in a Brooklyn Navy. Yard. Right. So you can choose as a kid what you're doing in school. I see. So you are saying that basically the asbestos scare was justified regardless of the hysterical exactly. involvement in it. Exactly. They, they should have worked on it and done it and, and, and cleared it up as soon as possible Absolutely. because it was urgent to do it. Absolutely, because we don't uh, know what the long-term effects right, are. Right. God bless you. I appreciate you so your straightening out some of these situations. Uh, thanks what so a difference between talking to somebody who knows what he's talking about and people who just take chances with information. God bless you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me ask you a question. What did you say about Clinton? Well, Jackie, I wanted, this is the end of the year now. You started your show, beginning of the year, thank God, still running so successfully, attacking the weak points of the president. And right. people were critical of you. Right. And people didn't want to come to the show. And they right. said, how can you attack the president? Right. And then came this landslide. And instead of being politically incorrect, you're now politically correct. And right. those who didn't want to come are breaking down my door for tickets all the time. Right. So how do you see the year in review with Clinton? Well, I see the, uh, every, well, everything you're saying. I know it's all self-serving for me to admit it, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to add to it, but to elaborate on it. But the truth of the matter is it's exactly what happened. That's precisely the sequence of events. When I first started, everybody condemned me for my political incorrectness to attack the President of the United States. And even though I was getting huge laughs about uh, almost everything I said about Clinton, there was a certain percentage of resentment and hate towards me because of how do you pick on a President of the United States? Now, uh, everything I'm saying is almost mild compared to what everybody is thinking. There's a level of contempt that I see now towards, uh, towards Clinton that I never saw for any president in my lifetime. And I'm no youngster. I don't want to tell you exactly why I'm not a youngster. It's none of your business. I happen to be more than 37. I don't know, quite a bit more. I, I don't have to tell everybody. But the point is that it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's literally is a, a national kind of rejection for everything he represents. They see now through him, and it's very difficult for him to even resurrect himself. You know, people say Reagan's popularity was also down to almost 40% after two years in office. That's because he didn't accomplish anything, and his program at that time was still not in working order. He was still on the, on the sliding side of the economic situation before he reversed everything. But now... Clinton is not in such a terrible reversal in terms of his popularity because of the economic problems. Everything in the economic situation is in his favor. The world situation is even in his favor. There's no immediate threat to America from any place or any source. People are not dying in the streets. Everything seems to be getting better except Clinton. He's the only thing that seems to be getting worse because people know they've seen so many reasons to disbelieve everything he says. First it started with one lie. They want to forgive him. People want to basically love a president so they want to convince themselves that he's really telling the truth. He didn't mean it. Then it was another lie. 
Why? And a third lie. Then it was one girl. They said it can be. Then it was another girl. Can be either. Then it was a fourth girl. Now it's now it's sexual harassment cases from every state of the union. Now we want you to pay for all these sexual harassment cases. I don't ask him to pay for my sexual harassment cases. Could you picture a president asking you to pay for sex? Now it's uh, this Paula Jones could not only not only is complaining that he was in the room and told her that, that listen this my pants are off help out <laughs> which is a pathetic disgusting thing to even repeat it's so embarrassing to even mention it i hate to say this on a, and in front of families that are listening on the radio but that's exactly what happened took his clothes off i can't swear that it happened but that's what she's accusing him of and she even took a lie detector test that she could swear that she could identify his genitalia could you picture president that predicament it's the same predicament as joe barafuco she could identify his genitalia. The whole country is walking around now wondering, what has he got this genitalia? It's three years later, she still remembers it. What could it be? Everybody is wondering, what is it? Is it a map of Arkansas? Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> the whole country is, is in a predicament now, judging a president on this basis. Usually you judge a president on foreign policy, <laughs> on housing, on employment. Hey, you have to wonder, is he walking around with his pants on or off? How often does he... It's, 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 it's so embarrassing, I'm ashamed to even talk about it. <laughs> yeah. and he, has, he has not done one thing with any consistency, even when he hasn't blatantly lied. He vacillated for reasons that have nothing to do with anything legitimate. It's blatant opportunism every time. But we have to go into a commercial now, which is urgently important because they're selling better things, better quality items now. Listen carefully. Bob Grant wouldn't want you to miss this. For a few dollars, you can see me in person. Uh, I don't want to make an issue that I'm at the Golden Theater on 45th Street. They're begging me to make an announcement. They give you the number, so I'm forcing myself. It's 239-6200. 239-6200. They're even begging me to repeat it. I don't even want to mention it, but that's the number for my theater, and that's where it's packed all the time, except for the fact that you could probably still buy a ticket. How you could buy without without seats, I don't know. But it's 239-6200. It's up to you. I'm not begging. I'm just asking. If you got time, it's up to you. If you're not, you could come anyway. Because whatever you have to do is nothing compared to seeing my show. But I don't want to go into it. Let's go into the question of what of, of, of President Clinton, which we brought up a minute ago. Do you know? Do you know that this is amazing? That after this uh, whole case, which he's involved with, with this uh, Paula Jones, and after she swore she could identify his genitalia, which makes me wonder how how. Uh, how stupid people must be to dismiss a case out of hand. You know, as soon as you're a Democrat, you immediately dismiss anything against them. Just like they did when, when Nixon had the Watergate situation. Every Republican had to hear a smoking gun at the very end after three months of accusations before they were willing to believe one, one more accusation about Nixon. Because as soon as you become a politician, you fight for your man, and morality means nothing. You pretend to be concerned about the country, but somehow it's amazing that not one Republican was able to believe one thing about Nixon, and not one Democrat want to believe one thing about uh, uh, about Clinton. Not only don't they want to believe it, but they just try to stymie any effort to investigate it. They try to block any thought of investigating or even questioning. Now, even now, after Clinton was caught with 12 different liars who are partners of his, who are going to jail, about to go, who are quit, who are fired, Democrats are still trying every gimmick they could think of to block any investigation of the situation. I could understand if they, if they studied it, but they don't even make an effort to even want to study or find out about it. Because the politicians, that's why it's no, it's no accident to be that people basically have nothing but contempt for politicians. Because when the, when the issue becomes important, when the whole country's faith is involved, if their man is the crux of the problem, they never allow you to even look into it, no matter how crooked it might be. Clinton tomorrow could shoot 45 Jewish children right in the heart, and they'll all say it's nobody's business, but if you want to question it, you're not allowed. You can't look into it because shooting people is not the worst thing in the world. He couldn't do it, and if he did, we, we got no time to look into it because there's more important things. The airway excuses they give you every time you want to question Clinton about Whitewater. This happened nine years ago. This happened 12 years ago. They give you dates. They don't say he didn't do it, but he did it too long ago. He was only the governor. You can't count it. He was only looking for a job. It's nobody's business. <laughs> what right does anybody have to disturb him? It's not big money. It's only a half a million dollars. Then you tell him it's 300 million. So what? 300 million? There's still more money in the world. Why should this count that much? Why should this type of man in the middle of all the important work he has, which is to keep robbing people? I mean, it's just so idiotic that everybody has to protect the person from his own party. What did you want to say? What, what is more idiotic and wrong than to have to postpone Paula Jones' case until he leaves office? It should be just the opposite. When I practiced law years ago again, we had a case with, with Reagan, who was Reagan's uh, treasury man. And he was the plaintiff, and right away he settled the case because he didn't want to go into office uh, burdened by litigation. That's the way it's usually done. In this case, it's the reverse. 
Here, we have to wait for the president to, uh, to finish his office before we find out what's really true about him. Why should she have to postpone the examination? He's supposed to have the same examination as Michael Jackson. Why should Michael Jackson have to have it and not President Clinton? Not only that, at any other job, if there is enough substantial reason to assume that there's a possibility of guilt, if the suspicion has some basis, or there's any possibility of an indictment, that you are immediately suspended from your job until the investigation is over, until all the questions are answered. Either you're suspended or they investigate it immediately. Here they don't suspend them, they don't investigate them, and you're supposed to pretend nothing happened, no matter how conclusive the proof might be. There could be enough proof now to indict any man into a jail by Thursday. But because he's the president, he's immune from it, no matter how, what, how, how formidable the evidence is. Am I right? A hundred percent. This is this remaking law. It's fraud all over the place. We went once to Michael Douglas's apartment, who was a backer of your show, and we marveled what a beautiful apartment was. And he's a wonderful crusader for the environment and wonderful movie star and all kinds of issues you discuss in your act. And now I read that he's repaneling his entire apartment with endangered mahogany from the Brazilian forest, that they're chopping whole forests to make his new apartment. I don't understand how, how these people can get away with this type of fraud right in our face. You're talking about Michael Douglas? Yes. Right. Well, let's go to the next question. Here is Leon on marijuana. Leon? Yes. Yes, sir. How are you? Okay, my friend. Good. What's on your mind? Huh? What's on your mind? Well, I just want to make, get a picture of me. I bumped into you a couple of months ago on 57th in Lexington. Right. My wife was with me on the corner. Right. And we spoke. Right. Uh... I'm the guy you call the frustrated comedian. I don't want to... I asked you... Uh, I don't want to... I don't want to hurt your feelings, my friend, but this is not the time to get involved in personal situations. Oh, people no, no, are, no, no. People are listening and they have to hear issues. They're not interested in me and you personally. Oh, no. The, uh, well, about this... The business... Well, I asked you... Uh, you know, people... When I used to travel, people said... Uh, I sounded like you. And I told them... Uh, uh, no, you sound like me because I'm older than you. Well, God bless you. It's nice to know there's somebody around that's older than me. Well, that's the problem. I'm 63. God bless you. As a matter you. of fact, I know Mo. Mo was up to my office. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but people are listening to a show. They're not interested in you and me and Mo and how old you are or I am. They want to know the issues. This is an issue-oriented show. We have to talk to what people are interested in. They don't care how old okay. you are. In my opinion, yes. marijuana is one of the greatest plants growing on, the, uh, on Earth. God bless you. Well, thanks for listening.